This is Montreal, DeRossi Street in the heart of the busy city. But here is an aspect of Montreal that may seem foreign to the average citizen. This young artist, three months ago, found this tree, decided to turn it into a piece of abstract sculpture. His idea was to add a little life to the city. Armand Vaillancourt, born about 185 miles from Montreal, lived at St. Ferdinand de Halifax, a one-time pre-medical student at the University of Ottawa and sometime sailor, is now a student at the Beaux-Arts School in this city. He was given permission to carve the tree by the owners of the property, the Jewish Community Center. My name is Bruce Ruddick. I am neither an art critic nor expert, and by profession I deal with human beings, their emotions, and the way they interact with their environment. I feel the artist shows his feelings a little more openly than the average person. And it might be a good idea for us to go see a few of the Montreal artists at work, at home, and enjoying themselves. This, the Place des Arts, at present a cooperative studio, was once used by the sculptor Soucy, who made many of the figures for the Parliament buildings in Ottawa. This figure, modeled in cement, is a study by Armand Vaillancourt, and the wood, knocked down by a recent hurricane and picked up about the city, is used for sculpture and often for fuel. This is the Place des Arts. An abandoned two-story building, it was converted eight months ago to a cooperative studio by a group of artists and students led by Robert Roussel. Work varies from sculpture, painting, and photography to silk screening and stage design. It is open all the time to anyone interested in working in these media. Classes are held here, and each month there is an exhibition by one of the group. One or two of the poorer artists sleep upstairs. Robert Roussel, born in Montreal's East End, joined the army at 18 and had a year and a half overseas service. After his discharge at 21, he studied for three years at the Montreal Art Gallery, aided by the Department of Veterans Affairs. Since then, he has been a full-time sculptor. He is married and has three children. Here is Armand Vaillancourt again as he works in the studio. Roger Gasnier emigrated from Paris to Canada only five and a half months ago. He is a management consultant and has been a spare time worker in sculpture and painting for seven years. Here he is preparing his entry in a sculpture competition sponsored by the Franciscans. Mario Merola, a 23-year-old Montrealer, by profession a mural painter, is seen here at his first attempt at wood carving. Jean-Jacques Dinel, 22 and another Montrealer, is an upholsterer by trade. He has only been doing wood carving for four months. Lucille, could you tell me how you got the idea for such a studio? Well, uh, the, I guess the main reason is that uh, no artist really by himself can have a big studio, especially for sculpture. So uh, I get the idea that together we can have a, a big studio and have a much better chance to put ourselves in the public. Mm -hmm. And what is the problem you have with this piece of sculpture here? Well, the problem I have with this piece here especially, I guess, is a uh, touch a lot of my piece because I've been working with wood eh? and it's about the material we can get the easiest way, because we have it from the tree that has been cut down by the city or a different place that we can mm -hmm. have them carry. And why the axe? Well, uh, I guess the axe is a very natural instrument to uh, wood carving. Lumberjack used it so well to do about anything they want. I suppose uh, an artist could express anything he wants also, so that's what I'm trying to do. Mm-hmm. You've done work in architecture, too. Well, yes, I have done uh, a few months ago on uh, Nantel House in uh, Bellevue. In Bellevue. 
I think it would be a good idea for us to see that house. Thanks very oh. much. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye. And here, in Westmount, in a lovely section overlooking Montreal, we see how sculptor and architect have worked together. This idea of embellishing buildings with works of art is not modern. In Asia, and in Europe, and in Central America, it has long been the custom. And in this work by Roussel, cut from pieces of metal, and superimposed, although it is a mural, we have a sculptured feeling. And let's see other examples of this kind of work in the city. This modern house on the slopes of Mount Royal was designed by the young architect Gilles Villandre for his mother, the Marquise de Fia. The chimney is a sculpture in a primitive style by another brother, Adrien Villandre, a well-known sculptor and ceramist. Let us leave this part of the city now and go to the home and studio of the young French-Canadian painter Jean-Paul Mousseau in the eastern end of Montreal. This is where the Mousseaus live, in a once abandoned warehouse. They choose to live here not merely because they are poor, but because it gives them an opportunity to use the imagination and to design to their own personal taste, which would be impossible in an ordinary rented flat. Here Musso lives with his wife and daughter. This is once a single large room which they partitioned into living, eating, sleeping and working quarters. His wife, Denise, seen here with her daughter, Catherine, is studying for a stage career. Musso is fond of chess and made his own set of selected pieces of driftwood, which he painted. He collects driftwood, roots, stones and plants because of his pleasure in natural form. The walls are tar paper, covered with laths and geometric patterns. This victory of the imagination over the environment expresses his way of life. Mousseau was born 27 years ago in this workers' district of Montreal. While still a schoolboy of 13, he took up painting classes because they were more pleasant than the general courses. At 15, he joined the Contemporary Art Society and has been painting seriously ever since. He works 12 to 6, six days a week in a French bookstore and paints here nightly and often late into the morning. Musso, do you feel that your interest in stones and leaves and driftwood and natural forms helps your painting? Not directly. Indirectly, uh, the feeling that I get when I see those forms in space, you know, I enjoy, well, I enjoy it so much, you know, that it, it gives me a, a hit, you know, to paint. You know. A hit to paint? Yeah. yeah. How do you feel you're coming along with this one? Well, really, I cannot tell right now. Right now, it's very very badly, not happy. And this one, have you finished this one? Yes. Are you satisfied with it? Well, quite pleased. I intend to present it to a next show at Le Chury with two others, with this one and the other one. At Le Chury? Yes, uh, within a few days. Uh, I just prepared it uh, now. You know. Musso has mentioned a relationship between art and feelings. I think it might be a good idea for us to visit with a few of the younger artists of Montreal and discuss this subject. We'll find them at Les Chouris. Les Chouris is a French word meaning beaching place or harbor. It's a cafe where they gather to exhibit their paintings and to enjoy themselves.
Students of the Beaux-Arts and the nearby School of Ceramics drop in for a coffee or lunch. Young painters, sculptors, musicians, poets, writers, photographers, dancers, and everyday people drop in for coffee or meals. The food is European. No liquor is sold and there are strict rules of behavior. The singer and guitarist are practicing a song written by a young French-Canadian. The waiters are artists and the photographs on the wall are by one of the staff. came to Canada three years ago with $100. They were born in Hungary. He is a painter himself and is sympathetic and very paternal to the young artists. He says he's very busy, but most of his customers are young and poor, and many eat on credit. He makes four or five kinds of coffee with his espresso machine. As well as the artists, there is quite a cosmopolitan crowd. Les Cherie appeals especially to new Canadians as it reminds them a little of European cafes. This group came to Canada from Italy about three years ago. Torio is discussing with his friends cartoons he's making for a movie. We are in the cellar of Les Chouris, a cafe gathering place for young artists and students predominantly. Every two weeks there is an exhibition here. And these are the preparations, the hanging of pictures for a group show. Practically all the artists here belong to a movement in painting called automatism. Ulysse Contois, 23, was born in Granby, Quebec. He supports himself as an engraver. His painting has been very sympathetically encouraged by his parents since he was eight years of age. Mousseau, work is characterized by a strong romantic feeling. Pierre Gobro had his first exhibition in 1942. He's 32 years of age. He's a freelance worker on radio and television. His particularly good mood today is due to the fact that a few hours ago his wife gave birth to their second child, a daughter. Robert Blair, 26, a native Montrealer, is at present a student of architecture in Les Cal des Beaux-Arts in Montreal. He has been painting for six years and his work is characterized by a warm and brilliant use of color. Rita Latendre, 25, was born in Drummondville, Quebec. She works as a designer in a factory and has been painting for seven years. Her work is noted for its sensitiveness and delicacy. Bernard Le Duc, 38 years of age, in Montreal, French-Canadian, married with one child, is a draftsman for the RCAF, and he's a pioneer in this type of painting called automatism, which is practiced by a few of the Montreal abstract painters. We know that 
uh, some of this art seems incomprehensible to you, you don't understand it, and so we're going to take this opportunity to get the artists themselves to answer a few questions about it. I wonder if anyone here would wish to try to say, how did you arrive at such a way of painting? Well, if you can choose me, uh, i tell you that it's, uh, it's an experience like any other. You uh, begin in some cases by chance. Uh, myself, someone gave me a box of uh, watercolors, and I began that way with purely figurative painting. And uh, my own uh, personal evolution has led me to abstract painting. Uh, it is an evolution. Yes, it's gradual. a definite uh, uh, gradual evolution, yes. Mm -hmm. And anybody come to it suddenly? Yeah, well, I started to, to make doodles at first uh, in school, but uh, I, I came to, uh, directly to automatism after that. From doodling? Yeah. Well, uh... <laughs> <laughs> from, from doodling yeah. to doodling. <laughs> I know that uh, it may seem difficult for some of you to understand. It's just as difficult for me to explain. I myself personally like many of these paintings. They speak to me, they communicate a feeling. And as I understand it, automatism means merely an approach, a beginning, by which the painter, on the canvas, with form, color, and shapes, attempts to express his own personal feeling. Would you say that's right? It seems to be right for me. Yes, but uh, the important uh, is that the automatism it, uh, is not the end, but the beginning. The okay. beginning of the painting. Yes, it is. So it isn't a specific style, it is a way of beginning a painting. It is a way of beginning, but uh, that can be uh, a, a great evolution, you know. And uh, it is uh, at that time that we have a philosophy of uh, automatism, but uh, this is very long to explain. It seems to allow a great deal of freedom of expression. Yes, it is. And uh, you can have uh, more or less automatism in a uh, picture, in a painting, mm -hmm. uh, according to the, the, the way uh, of the painter. Now, let us just take, if you're painting a horse, if they're two different techniques, it's two different horses, then. Mm. There's no question about that. No, I'm speaking of content of what people feel when they look at horse. Well, two painters. painters. Two painters. But, uh, and it's, it's not a horse either. Yeah, no, no, no. no. Well, uh, I mean, uh, and that's uh, where people make uh, most, uh, the most common mistake, yeah. uh, taking what uh, what it looks like as being the... What it is. What it is. What it well, is. Exactly. talking from the reality of, the, uh, of the, the picture, not from the outlook point of view of the, uh, the exterior point of view of, of a horse like. I mean, this is, a, this is not the subject matter. Well, a rose is a rose is a rose. No, a rose, a rose has never been a rose. It's a fawn before it being a rose. It's only by the, uh, the fawn association which creates the emotional, the emotional feeling. That's, that is what uh, is the reality in painting. What happens when you're painting? What do you feel? During the painting? Uh, a great, uh, I don't know how to explain it in English, je dirais vertige. Vertige? What would be the English equivalent of vertige? That would be uh, elation. And uh, I believe this elation can be transmitted from uh, the painting to the spectator. And this is art. So your art expresses feelings. Elation, as you said, would you say that it stimulates elation predominantly? Well, uh, I, w I would uh, bring out, I mean, it uh, bring uh, the expression, I mean, I would bring out this idea of uh, Elation. That's only one, uh, only one feeling. Yeah. You could express uh, serenity, perhaps someone else. Or in sadness. A painting with, uh, yes, or sadness. Yes. So any kind of feeling. Yes. So I imagine then that the painter would feel the feeling when he painted not only Vertige, which is Fernand Leduc's feeling, but any kind of feeling and the painting attempts to transmit that to an audience. Yes, and if it's successful, it will. But yes. Vertige is not only a feeling, it's a quality of a painting. It can be a sadness, it can be emotion, it can be free, it can be love, but the, the quality is a Vertige. What do you call it in English? Elation. Elation. Uh, an inspiration. No, no. Well, what about a cup of coffee? Well, maybe. A good maybe idea. A good idea. <laughs> Where we go. A bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Well, we have a very lively crowd here. Uh, lots of fun. Lots of fun. Sure. See you later. Before I go, I would like to ask you, is it difficult for a young painter to make a living in Canada? Yes, 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 yes for sure. Uh, even for uh, older painters, if they are uh, really creative, I suppose it's easy to make a living for uh, commercial artists of, uh, of any kind. I mean, uh, I think of two kinds of uh, commercial artists. The, the true, honest, real commercial artist who will accept himself as a commercial artist. He can make a living fairly easily. It's, it's a competitive field, but he can make a, a living. But there is another kind of uh, commercial artist, uh, less frank, I, I guess, the, the pseudo-creative artist, one who, who pretends to be a, a creative artist, but in reality, he does not express himself truly. He only tries to, um, he only tries to uh, flatter, to please, uh, the, the taste and the habits of a certain uh, section of the population. And uh, he sells uh, his work to the, this section. He's really, truly a commercial artist, although less frank. But for the truly creative artist, one who wants to express himself truly, to widen knowledge and uh, to bring something new, well, uh, it's, it's difficult. Impossible. Well, I'd like to thank you all for a very, very pleasant evening. Well, thanks very much, George. Come back again, Russ. I will come again. Well, you've just seen some of the young Montreal artists at work and at play. Remember, from just such a group, someday, someone may spring of such creative power as to surprise the world, and of whom we as Canadians will be very proud. This is Bruce Ruddick from Montreal. Good night, all. You've been on the spot with the National Film Board crew in Montreal. We have a guest. Dr. Robert Hubbard, who is Chief Curator of the National Gallery of Canada. Well, what's your first reaction to the film? Well, I have a rather immediate reaction to something that Dr. Ruddick said just at the end of the film, mm -hmm. and that is that uh, we may expect something to come out of this new movement in Montreal. Yes. Well, my contention is that something has already come out of it. In the way of painters? Yes, in the way mm -hmm. of two painters, yes. to be exact. Paul-Emile Bourdieu and Jean-Paul Riopel. Bourgeois started that movement, as a matter of Yes, fact. Bourgeois did. He began it around 1941 or 2. Something and like Riopelle was one of his students. Yes. And both these Canadian artists have achieved a very wide recognition, I believe. Yes, they're both represented in our National Gallery, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, both are represented in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Yes. And Riopelle in the Museum of Modern Art in Paris. This is a painting by Paul Emile Bourgeois. Uh, which he calls parachute vegeto, vegetable parachutes. But I suppose we shouldn't bother about taking that name too literally. Oh, I don't think we should. As a matter of fact, I think the uh, painting was painted first and the title added later. Which I believe is the case with most of this non-objective uh, uh, art. Yes. According to the, excuse me, according to yes. the, the theory as propounded by André Breton in France uh, some years ago, the painting actually comes from the subconscious. Now, while these may not look uh, too much to you like uh, vegetable parachutes, uh, I'd like you to know that the, it's a very, uh, the colors are really very beautiful here. The, uh, these are very lovely greens. And uh, the one of the things I think that bothers most people about this business of non-objective art is that uh, uh, the painters are dealing with uh, forms and uh, possibly symbols that just aren't recognized with people. They get to yes, I know, but there's I think an immediate response to be made to the beautiful color and the shapes, just as in music, you yes. know. Yes, where we don't demand so much uh, yes, exactly. understanding. Uh, in that connection, uh, you may remember that we had a visit from the Queen Mother. Indeed, yes. Only a week or so ago. Well, 
After I'd explained who Bortua was and the automatic movement, of course, she's quite knowledgeable about, knowledgeable about these things, um, she turned and said, uh, well, whatever he means, it's very rich and beautiful painting. Which, of course, is the way to look at these things. Yes, yes, I think so, too. Here is a painting by Riopel. I wish you could see the colors in it because they're very rich. The paint is laid on very heavily in great blobs, overlaid. Yes, bright reds here and, and glossy blacks and blues and greens. Now, of course, if you look for something uh, representational here, you're not going to find it. But if I was, uh, work like this seems to be to call for the imagination to play a part in the assessment of it. But, uh, yes, and uh, that reminds me of something that happened yesterday. I was in one of the dealer's galleries in Montreal. Uh, and saw a painting by Riopel, and not this one, but uh, another later one. And in front of it, there happened to be standing a small boy. And he was making remarks all over the place, and his mother was trying to shush him. But before she could do so, he had said, Mommy, this looks like a jungle. And uh, a little while later, he said, No, it, uh, it looks like something seen from the air. Yes. These these roads going through. Yes. So yes. there are all sorts of things that yes. stimulate the imagination. And it's very exciting to look at. Yes. Rather right. like music. Yes. You think? Yes, mm -hmm. I do. Um, it must help, I suppose, to uh, to know the painters uh, involved. Uh, oh, I think it still does. This is claimed to be a sort of uh, universal, uh, or I should say, spontaneous form of communication between artist and and public but it still helps enormously to know the painter. Mm -hmm. I remember hearing Bourgeois himself uh, sitting on a nail keg or something in his studio and talking to me about our environment in Canada, not only the physical, but also the sort of environment of thought and all that sort of thing, and how that's reflected in his painting, the, the sober, sort of somber colors. That so you feel that he really has the insight that an artist has. Oh, yes. Has uh, a poet's insight. Yes. Mm. Which is the kind of thing, I suppose, that uh, helps people to understand eventually once they can... Yes. Yes, I think it does. Our guest has been Dr. Robert Hubbard, who is chief curator of the National Gallery of Canada. On the Spot is a production of the National Film Board. The film was directed by Jean Paladé, Photography by Sutton and the sound by E.C.H. Muir and John Locke. The film editor was Gwen Barnhill, supervising editor was David Maravich, and the producer Robert Anderson. <laughs>